the Academy for Christian Thought. This is the second session of the Berean Bible Study. And today's topic is archaeology and the interpreter. So we'll look at um, <coughs> what we're going to talk about today in the context of two major topics. We're going to discuss biblical archaeology. And for those of you who are watching this um, online and elsewhere, hi to you. We're looking at the art and science of archaeology because it is both an art and science as a, as a composite field. And then we're going to look at something that could be a bit jarring for, for some people here. It has to do with what is called the rise of the interpreter. The interpreter was a collection of people for hundreds of years who began to interpret mostly Torah and eventually led to a second collection of writings that we later call the prophets. And then a third writing called the writings itself, including um, the narratives and the chronicles. There is another group of interpreter, and that group today we call them the New Testament writers. They were also interpreting Torah and the other Old Testament writings. Um, for those of you who are interested in the details of archaeology, I'll send you the full slides that everyone say within a week, but I've got to tell you there are a lot of slides, about 40 slides on that alone, because two years ago, we did that as a full seminar, so we're compressing it for a single day. And we're going to start with, like I said, the art and science of archaeology. It's a historical and scientific study of materials rather than abstract ideas. So what does it mean? It means that when you look at writing, and we mentioned last week, writing only began 5,500 years ago. Before that, there were no human writings as far as we know. When you write something, you are expressing an idea. When you draw something, you are symbolizing something that may or may not exist, a bird, a cow, a bison. But when you don't have either, you just have artifacts, you are now studying what I call material, uh, material finds, and you find that in archaeology mostly. Biblical archaeology has two categories. One is the stuff, the, the stones, the shards, the pottery. Another category are ancient writings within it. So strictly speaking, archaeology can also include um, writings, but for the most part, it's beyond writing. It's beyond uh, the time when writing was invented. As far as we're concerned, modern biblical archaeology began in the 19th century uh, by American clergymen in response to general archaeology. So let's go back to general archaeology. Someone says, when, when the first humans decide to do a scientific study of things of the past, well, the argument could be it started with our friend Napoleon Bonaparte in Egypt. Napoleon Bonaparte in 1798-99 was trapped in Egypt as he was trying to capture India from the British. And um, with a famous battle with the British, he lost. But eventually during that period, they discovered what we now call the Rosetta Stone. It's in the British Museum. It's you walk right in, pow, right in front of you. And that stone had three different languages. And for the first time, they could figure out what ancient hieroglyphics meant for the first time. And that was the beginning of Egyptology, the official study of um, the Egyptian Empire. About 30 or 40 years later, um, on the eastern side in Mesopotamia, was another discovery very similar to this other discovery. And this discovery is in western um, Iran, and it's called Bisitun, and there they found also three different languages, right on the wall. And you got a book here? You show it here. Right. It's in this book. It's really high up over here, carved in stone. And it's well over 2,500 years old. And over a nine year period, just hanging by ropes and ladders, one person managed to um, in decipher, or sorry, inscribe all of it, copied it down, brought back to London, to the British Museum, and eventually they got it. In any case, these two places began what we now call modern archaeology, but these were also the two places that began human writing. So it's quite interesting. Now, what's the connection for us as Christians? The connection is these are also the two places where they were connected by a single personality, a single person, Abraham himself. Abraham was born in one and then he went to the other. So quite a fascinating coincidence. In the context of this, by the 19th century, uh, late 19th century, Christians began to ask some very serious questions. The two areas where archaeology sort of began are also two areas that are very, very important to the Christian witness, the Bible itself. So shouldn't we have our people in, get involved in this? 
And, and I say this with a bit of sadness, but in those days, uh, most of the major archaeologists were actually pastors, clergymen. They knew the Bible, they believed in God, and they went out and looked for it. Fascinating. Today, um, I would say that the majority of archaeologists or biblical archaeologists are not necessarily confessional Christians in any meaningful sense of the word. They're, they're very rare to find both. And you do find um, people like this, but they're not that common anymore. In any case, the goal was to discover proof of scientific and historical accuracy of the Bible. So that was a stated goal from the very beginning. Let's do that. Long story short, today, uh, now in 2016, what's the net result of their discoveries? Did the archaeological discovery prove scientific and, uh, and historical accuracy of the Bible, or did it not? Well, people will say 50-50, let's put it this way. In many cases it does, and in many cases it doesn't. When of course. 50 50 though, I mean, how do you define that? Well, it's a very loose term, meaning you win some, you lose some. And sometimes, because bear in mind, you can find an artifact, and there's a lot of work between finding it, deciphering it, and then finding a conclusion for it. So along the way, there's a lot of people. Would you say that that's accurate or not? I mean, it's part this, accurate, this, right? this is serious stuff. Yeah. This I know, but this is, is, would you say that's 180 percent? This, no, this is among the 50 percent that made it. That made it. Yeah, there are, there are other 50 percent that didn't quite make it. Let's make it out here to have a look at it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this is a museum quality live um, size model of the Cyrus cylinder. Probably the most important physical artifact we've got that matches um, what is mentioned in Ezra, the book of Ezra. This is the artifact that tells us about Cyrus saying the Jews can go back and rebuild this temple. And discovered in the 19th century. You mentioned the Jews, though, but uh, it, it conquered lands. That's that right, and Jews were among the conquered lands. Right. So here's a bit of fibbing, and, and, and I'm going to go into it because it will take a long time. But basically, this, this inscription says, and the King Cyrus says, all the people can go back and build. And the Jews only mentioned them. <laughs> so, so the way the, the spin for Ezra was, uh, God told him to let us go back. What he did not say was, God told him to tell everyone to go back. And, and he never said it's Yahweh, he said it was his Babylonian god, Marduk. But the way the biblical writer said it is well, Yahweh. So you go figure, right? Um, and that's why I'm saying, if you want to seriously take the idea of God and worship God, be very careful that you don't worship the Bible instead of God, because the Bible is supposed to be a mirror to the things of God, it is not God itself. But when this was discovered in the 19th century, you can imagine it sent shockwaves. At first, a lot of excitement. For the first time, we have physical proof from Western Europe, from Iran, that the writings of the Old Testament is actually attested. But when they finally found out what it actually said, then they got a bit disturbed <coughs> by what it actually said. In any case, let's move on. European biblical archaeologists tend to be lay people more concerned about the findings uh, whatever the conclusion. So we have the American clergyman and then you've got the European lay people. So these are the two kinds of early archaeologists. From the US, very excited clergymen. From Europe, mostly not clergymen, but they don't mind what the discovery was. They were not there with a, with a specific agenda to prove or not, or not prove. In the American case, it was largely to prove because there was great excitement. They said it must be there because it's got to be true. Now today, Every Bible commentary draws from archaeological research to support the interpretation so that every sermon is inevitably influenced by the research of field excavators, whether you like it or not. Which means no serious modern pastor can actually say, I can do my sermons disregarding biblical archaeology because every known published commentary relies on archaeology. There's only two ways to rely on, on knowledge. Either you say, we investigate and find out. Or the other way is, God just gave me information directly to my brain. That's, it's possible, there are groups who say that, but that's all you have left to say, because there's no other way to know. You either know by discovery, or you know because you're the hotline to God. Or you rely on, you rely on others, right? Um, well, the others are relying on also hotline of <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. right? When, when you reduce it down, there are only two ways to know. Either you know through supernatural means or you know through natu natural means. That, that's really it. At this stage, I'm not here to uh, make a judgment on whether one is right or one is wrong, but to say these are the two ways. 
And for the longest time before modern archaeology, the only way was really what other people said in the past. So someone said in the past, someone said in the past. So for example, if you say how, before modern archaeology, how do you know something is true? And the quotations are normally pastors or scholars who came before, including John, you hear the name, Jonathan Edwards, yeah. Martin Luther, John Calvin, all the way to Augustine and all that. If you ask another question, how do they know? Now you've got a problem. Now you've got a problem because none of them were there. None of them have very few have been to the Holy Land, so know where it is exactly. If you go back further, say, to um, the 10th century, 8th century, 7th century, few people know how to get to Jerusalem from, from Europe, um, let alone know where to go to find it. So you can see the importance of archaeology was kind of earth-shattering because the first time it's a double-edged sword. You can either confirm or disconfirm. But you can't prove and disprove. Now, what does that mean? It means you can, with archaeological information, you can draw up likelihood of something being true or likelihood that is not true. You can't really prove something or disprove something. For example, you can't disprove whether Jesus Christ was resurrected because it's beyond the law. It's beyond science for that matter because you can't prove a non existence. In the other case, you can't prove it either. So, for example, you can't prove whether King David did something or said something. You were not there. No one who was there is here today. And even if you say, oh, but we found something purported to be David writing something, that's what it is. It's an assertion. You still can't prove it. In fact, proof is so difficult, you can't prove a lot of things today, believe it or not. If I give you a letter and I say, George Bush wrote this in 1999, there's no way to prove it. You, can, you, you have to go on the propensities of likelihood. It's likely he wrote it because if he didn't, he should, he should object to it by now, right? So proof is a very, very powerful statement. Be very careful about using the word proof. It's evidence. It's a strong evidence. Um, okay, circumstantial. Uh, in fact, most evidence is circumstantial. So let's move on. Now, in terms of archaeological periods in Palestine, um, just listen up, don't take any notes about the details, it's a lot of uh, dates. And it's only there when you begin to teach. Remember, this whole course is about you teaching eventually, not me teaching you, but that you will have the confidence to teach people using archaeological knowledge. So, in terms of the periods, and you have all the slides, the pre-8000 uh, BC period, we don't really talk about it very much because we know so little about it. There are very, very few museums in the world that has anything that old. And one of them is Ankara and in Istanbul. So if we get to go to these two places, they have incredible finds of um, these sort of people. But we start with the Paleolithic period between 8,000 and 4,500 4, BC. And then we have the copper period, copper and stone, Chalcolithic. And then we have the early bronze, middle bronze and late bronze age. Now, some of you have heard about the Bronze Age period, right? The Bronze Age period is before 1200 BC. And they call it bronze because at the time, the technology of smelting was, you could smelt something like this, um, this thing called bronze, with bronze salts. What happened in 1200 BC was the ability to make furnaces hot enough so that you can actually melt iron ore. So they call it the Iron Age. And iron always beats bronze in every war. And you'll find a book of Samuel where they say, the Philistines have iron swords. Let's not fight them. Yeah, it's over. You can't fight them because they will beat you every time. And so the idea of iron and bronze, this interchange between this period, is so important that archaeologically we always date it like that. And within the, uh, the Bronze Age, you've got early, middle, and late bronze. And some people have asked, why do they have early, middle, and believe it or not, it matches the Egyptian kingdom of the early kingdom, the middle kingdom, and the late kingdom. Because Egypt is so important to us in dating techniques because they were so meticulous in keeping records that modern archaeologists rely on Egyptian chronology to date the things that we are thinking about in terms of ages. And Iron Age itself, there are three. That's Iron Age 1, Iron Age 2, and Iron Age 3. Let's just say the first Iron Age is called uh, Judging, the period of Judges, 1200 to 1000 BC. The second Iron Age is Monarchic. In kingdoms, the kings of, uh, from King Saul or King David all the way down to the last king. So that will be about 1000 BC to 586. 586 BC is a very important um, date. So if you need to remember two or three dates, memorize it deep inside. First one is 1000 BC. 
right? That's the time of King David. The second date to remember is 586. That is the fall um, of Jerusalem. And that's the beginning of what is called the exilic period. Why is this important? Because your Bible will be very much determined by this period. The writings of the Bible will be either pre-exilic, exilic, or post-exilic. The third date is 539. That's when they came back to rebuild the second temple. <coughs> So with these three dates, you've got an idea of where things are. So now, five is when you say four Jerusalem, you actually mean the temple itself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, temple, I should say temple, modern Jerusalem. Um, now in terms of <coughs> these dates, now I'm going to mention three or four characters in the Old Testament so that you have a flow because you need to know who came first. Because if you don't know whether Abraham came first or Moses came first, you're going to have a lot of problems. So let's start with the big names first, right? Adam and Eve, the big kahuna at the beginning. <laughs> The second big kahuna was what? Noah. Noah was like a second Adam in a sense. It all started all over again, right? Now at this stage, we're not interested in whether they're historical, not historical. That's irrelevant for our purpose right now. We just want to name the characters in chronological sequence. So we have Adam and Eve, and then we've got Noah. And the, the third one, the most important one is Abraham, who eventually became Abraham, right? So Abraham is the one that links the two places where writing began and the two places where archaeology began, Mesopotamia and Egypt. Uh, this uh, transit journey. And um, after Abraham, now Abraham is uh, called the first of the patriarchs, the first of the fathers, and normally you, I memorize it this way, A-I-J-J. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. A-I-J-J. Remember these, these sequences? You are good to go. What happens after Joseph? He became prime minister of Egypt, right? And after he became prime minister of Egypt, the story was hundreds of years later, they became kind of slaves. And then we have another person who rose up, Moses. And who was Moses? You have to say he is Egyptian. Whatever else he is, um, biologically, he is first and foremost prince of Egypt. Very important to understand because his very name is a name of a god. His name, Moses, came from Tut Moses. It's an Egyptian uh, pharaoh, pharaoh, pharaonic names. And all pharaohs in Egypt are named after gods. It's almost like saying, son of God. Now you're going to see the relationship between Moses and Jesus later on. And why, by the time you read the Gospels, you will see the Gospel writers, especially Matthew, making sure that when you read the story of Jesus, you will keep thinking Moses at every level. Because Jesus is the new Moses. Okay? Born in a certain place in Canaan, Palestine, had to run for his life because, because the king was trying to kill all the babies, and eventually landed in Egypt, came out of the through from the water, went to the desert for 40, one is 40 days and one is 40 years, right? And then both gave laws, they were lawgivers, um, in terms of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. So you have all these connections and you look for these connections in the entire bible and you will see it again and again these are called motifs m-o-t-i-f-s the third iron age is the iron age of assyria babylonia and persia so let me repeat the iron age again uh, let's start with the bronze age there are three bronze ages and three iron ages the first bronze bronze age called the early bronze age and the second one is called the middle bronze age and that's when abraham and the patriarchs supposed to be alive in. The third Bronze Age um, is the Mosaic and Aaronic Bronze Age, which means the age of Moses and his brother Aaron. The three Iron Ages. The first Iron Age is the age of the judges. So I'm connecting the historical and geological ages with the biblical age. The second Iron Age is Monarchy, the kings. And the third Iron Age is Assyria, Babylonia and Persia. Why? Because these were the three civilizations that eventually took over Palestine. So if you recall, for some of you will remember, in 722 BC, Assyria attacked Samaria and took over the northern kingdom. 586 BC, Babylon took over the southern kingdom. Now how I remember this is A before the B. So A is northern kingdom, B is southern kingdom, that's how I remember it. And then comes Persia that took over everything else. And finally, after the Iron Age 3, in 322 BC on, we have the Hellenistic period because that's the uh, period 
of um, Alexander the Great. Some people will quibble with this to say we should really call it Hellenic rather than Hellenistic. Hellenistic is after Hellen period, but for purposes of archaeology, a lot of people just call it Hellenistic. So let's move on from here. Now, let's go further. How about the New Testament and the archaeological periods? What I've just mentioned about the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, that's Old Testament stuff, right? New Testament stuff is, I'm going to mention very quickly in succession, the Roman period, Byzantine period, the Muslim Arab period, the Crusader period, the Mamluk period, Ottoman period, the British period, and in 1948, the State of Israel. So that's a continuous occupation of people. So when you think about it, the last time Israel was Israel as an independent nation was 586 BC. That's a long time ago. And it wasn't an independent nation again until 1948. Now in between, by the way, in the second century um, BC, oh, sorry, it, there, were, there were little excursions among some of the Jewish people living there fighting against the Romans. So you've got the Maccabean period, but those were really very short lived and they were not fully independent. But in terms of full independence, is 1948. So let me quickly go through some of them. 63 BC to 324 AD, the Roman period. The Roman period is precisely where Jesus and apostles and all the writings of the New Testament happen. So Rome is a very important feature for us, which means if you go to the Metropolitan Museum or the British Museum, and you want to know about um, what happened in Palestine in the time of the New Testament, the Roman period is where you want to go to, to see. 324 BC, uh, AD to 638 AD, the Byzantine period. Byzantine, as a lot of you know, refers to the Greek-speaking Roman Empire rather than the Latin-speaking Roman Empire. Headquarters is in today's Istanbul. So that's why Istanbul is so important in archaeology, in New Testament studies, and in Christian studies as a whole. Well, the empire actually shifted, right? Because Completely the shifted, yeah. Western was being conquered by the... Uh... Right, right. Uh, it'll be nice to say it's a shift, but it's not as simple as that. It was also a lot of Poland you know, people saying, this is me, and it took a long time to recognize <coughs> it. Now we come to the Muslim period. Muslim period is very long, from 638 all the way to um, 1918, long time. Among the Muslim period, you've got the Arab period, 638 to 1099. Then it's followed by the Crusader period. When I say Crusader, um, it's in Muslim lands. And it's kind of nice to say Christians control it, but in fact, we control just a few towns here and there. And, and then they gave up because they realized they can't maintain it. So Crusader period is quite short, uh, 1099 to 1291. And then came the Mamluk period. These are the periods of the Muslim slaves. The slave people came out of it. And then we have the Ottoman period, 1517 to 1918. Ottoman is really, really huge. It stretched all the way from, you know, very much um, east parts of Eastern Europe all the way to, um, boy, it'll be near India. It's, it's really, it's really huge period. So the, the Arabs were actually controlling um, the Holy Land? Oh, history? yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why there was a crusade in the first place. Because the argument was they didn't allow the Christians to go to Jerusalem anymore. But the, the Christians still had a base in. Yeah, but they were not. They were not in control. Totally not. They were just pilgrims. Yeah. Okay. Then the British period, 1918 to 1948, and followed by the State of Israel. Now, we've just um, laid out the archaeological periods compared to the Old and New Testament in terms of timelines. Let's now look at who are the biblical <coughs> archaeologists. And I'm going to start with um, Edward Robinson, 1841. So let me just begin by saying these biblical archaeologists, the very earliest ones, were explorers and scholars of the 19th century inspired by the Bible, and they laid foundations for the discovery in what are called the Bible lands. Edward Robinson, he did a seven-year survey of Palestine, the Sinai, Petra, and adjacent regions. 30 years later, Charles Warren. He identified Herod's temple in Jerusalem. Okay, he's very careful. It's not Solomon's temple. It's not even the second temple. It's Herod's temple. What <coughs> in the world is Herod's temple? Well, Herod's temple is really the um, renovated part of the second temple, of this temple. But it's so significantly renovated that we can't even tell the difference anymore because it's, you know, one reason is we don't know where it is. Okay, but, but the claim was I found it. 
So this was 1871. Remember I said to you last week, anything that was discovered before the 1950s and 60s cannot be dated. Why? They had no carbon dating yet. So how did they date anything? By a lot of guessing, by looking at the stones to see whether the inscriptions there can match it. So there are two ways of dating things, and you'll discover that every time that the newspaper says, we just discovered the tomb of so-and-so, right? There are top, typically two ways of dating things. One is by looking at either the text or looking at the stone by checking the, uh, the geology, the patina, <coughs> whether it ages a certain way by looking at the molecules and looking at the whatever is on the stone itself. And then another way um, of looking at this is to, to read the inscription, to see how it's written. In the same way today, literature experts in English will tell you, if I look at Middle English and Old English compared to Modern English, I can tell which one is which because they use different words to mean different things and they write it differently, with different syntax sometimes even. The third person, 1890, very, very big name, Sir Flinders Petrie, P-E-T-R-I-E. -E. He, in 1890, developed the first scientific stratigraphy to Palestinian archaeology and discovered the Menepta Stele that he said 1896. You remember the Menepta Stele, right? The Stele that talks about this way. 1922, William Fox Albright, very big name as well. Today, there's an Albright Institute in uh, Jerusalem. And the fifth person is 1930, John Gostang, he discovered Jericho. Now, again, a huge deal because for the longest time, we we're not sure whether this was accurate because no one knew where Jericho was, so he discovered it. Let's move further to the 1950s. 1955, Yigal Yadin, Hazor and Masada discovered these two places in 1963. <coughs> Yigal Yadin is also famous that eventually he became the defense minister of Israel and famously was involved in, some people say stealing, some people say appropriating, and some people say taking the Dead Sea Scrolls from the Jordanian side of Jerusalem. It's called the PAM, the Palestinian uh, Archaeological Museum. So they took it and now it's in Jerusalem. 1956, James Pritchard discovered Gibeon. Now you know James Pritchard? There are two volumes of very famous, remember the two volumes from Pritchard? Yeah. 1961, um, probably the most important female archaeologist to date, the uh, cigar chomping, very heavy laden um, camel riding and tough talking woman, Dean Kathleen Canyon, discovered the city of David near Jerusalem. Quite an amazing discovery. Now, Kathleen Canyon, um, if you read anything about her in Wikipedia and stuff like that, it's quite quite interesting because she was a she was a tough cookie. 1964, George Ernest Wright and William Deaver discovered Giza. Now, all these names I mentioned, Haz, uh, Hazor, Masada, Gibeon, Giza. These are all major biblical sites that we, we go to today. So if you go on a typical two-week tour of Israel, you will go to all these sites one by one to see it. 1968, Benjamin Bazaar discovered and worked on the Temple Mount, the mount where this thing sits on. Um, 1979, Gabriel Barkai uh, famously discovered the Ketef Hinnom, which is called the Silver Amulet. To date, probably the oldest physical artifact that has direct rele relevance to the book of Numbers. It talks about a blessing and find it there. And still alive, by the way. Uh, I first met him in the 1990s and he was, I think, in his 70s. He's still, he's still alive and kicking uh, strong. 1994, uh, Israel Fil uh, Finkelstein and David Ushishkin, Megiddo. So, um, let me just show you some of the photographs of these people. So, yeah, so alive and kicking. I just want to show you that biblical archaeology is a pretty new thing. Many of them are still alive. Until the 1950s and 60s, they didn't know how to protect the place. So they would just keep on digging and throwing things away. Today, by the 60s, they said, you can't do that. So they started saying, well, let's cut a square and another square here. And you don't dig everything. Leave it for future people with better tools and better knowledge to dig further. So it's very controlled today. And... Um, Oh, that, that's that's Kathleen Kenyon. Oops, where am I? That's Kathleen Kenyon. Can you see her? Wow. Yeah, she, yeah, wow indeed. She's a tough one. But by the way, all these field archaeologists, I gotta tell you, um, they're really tough people. 
Uh, it's really hard. 99% of the archaeologists find nothing significant and we'll never know who they are. I'm one of them, by the way. <laughs> but so for every two or three people whose names are out there, they're partly lucky, they're partly very meticulous, and they're partly, they've been there for 30, 40 years, and that's why they discovered this other stuff. So a lot of our contributions to it. I, I wish in many ways the church would acknowledge their uh, contribution every once in a while, maybe once a year. Just mention that. You know, there are people who came before us who discovered stuff that's used by scholars in major libraries and it becomes sermons and become books, and that's how we know stuff. But um, we don't do a lot of that. So hopefully this lecture will go out and you guys will remember it, okay? The origin of biblical archaeology. So when we ask the question, where do you dig and why do you dig any kind of archaeology, I'm being facetious here. Normally it is where land is cheap, where political advantages allow it, and, um, and it's accessible to excavators, which means, for example, you will probably never, ever, have an excavation under Buckingham Palace or on Fifth Avenue or under the White House because land is too expensive, not gonna happen. So by definition, archeology span is a selective science. You select where you can dig. You, you rarely say, I feel like digging here, and you can't. That alone tells us one thing. Be an oh, very, very much. Or if you can't dig, you can't dig, yeah. Or when you're contracting subways and you come across something. So by definition, um, on the one hand, we shouldn't worship archaeology because it cannot be a complete science. It's a major source but not a complete source. On the other hand, um, we mustn't discount it because until we had modern archaeology, so much of what we think we know were actually guesswork. It's quite stunning. It's almost like asking yourself, now that we've got a camera and high-definition 4K, 5K cameras, would you go back to paintings to see what something looked like? I mean, you could. But my God, why would you? Because in the old days, before cameras were invented, someone's impression of painting was the best you could do to see what something looked like. And we still have it today. We don't have a choice. If you want to know what Da Vinci looked like, you don't have a choice but look at some of his drawings of himself. No choice. Okay, what about biblical archaeology? It refers to, I'm going to mention a few names, Egypt, Greece, Iraq, Iran, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Italy, Syria, and Turkey. So these are the major places where, when we say, let's do biblical archaeology. It's not the same thing as holy lands. Holy lands are largely Palestine. But this is, um, we're talking about the ancient Near East, yeah. I'm going to give you a brief history. Well, the history is very brief, only four points, okay? Four days. The 19th century, the earliest attempts to map the Bible lands. So the 19th century, people asking questions. Shall we map the Bible land? What do you mean by mapping it? Maps are very important, by the way, because we use a lot of maps today to know where we are and where we want to go. And map technology was really, really, really new because until the 16th century, we really didn't have reliable maps until the, the, uh, the Dutch began to have different projections, the most famous being the Mercator projection of how to make something round to be flat and you still know where to go. 19. 18, the fall of the Ottoman Empire opened up the ancient biblical lands to systematic investigation for material remains of human habitation. So 1918, which happens to be the end of the First World War, was a signal event because one of the most uh, significant civilizations in the world was the Ottoman Empire. They were not going to let you start digging around, right? But it was a confluence of technology, science, opportunity. By 1918, sailing ships uh, with steamships and all that became to be so well um, developed as technology, you can now travel to a lot of places quite safely compared to before sailing tech uh, before steam steamship technology took over. So 1918 opened up opportunities. Before that, before 1918, you you got to risk going to the Middle East to try to dig anything because war was going on. Two, um, well, I shouldn't say two, three or four people were very involved in the Ottoman Empire that, that eventually gave rise to major countries. One of them was Saudi Arabia, another one was Iraq itself, and uh, they, one of them you know very well, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, if you know the name, went to Jesus College in Cambridge, and he studied archaeology and foreign languages, and eventually he helped invent a new country, that country today we call it Saudi Arabia. Um, and there were others, and some were women, 
who helped uh, invent another country called Iraq, another one called uh, Iran was eventually developed out of that. They were all British land for a long time. 1950s, advances in long distance air travel prompted an increase in interest. All of a sudden, you could go to a, a great distance quite readily. Now, some of you may, may know this. What is the first airline in the world, the first commercial airline in the world? I'll give you a hint, it's not in America. Qantas. And what does Qantas stand for? Australia. Queensland and Northern Territory Airline Service. It was just two provinces <coughs> in Australia. And eventually, it became so important to send things across. They began to build bigger engines, bigger airframes, and to go across the great oceans. And of course, the major breakthrough was, could you go across the Pacific Ocean? Because the Pacific Ocean is anything but Pacific. It is very rough water. The 1950s made a huge difference because of the development later on of jet engines that allow us to bring huge amounts of material across and back. The 21st century advances in scientific discovery, technological inventions of more complex tools, and the interdisciplinary contributions of, of such fields allowed it to go to probe into places that are non-invasive. Today, you can go to a cave and find out what's be behind a wall without digging inside. That's quite amazing technology. And we can have 3D scanning technologies to recreate what we saw. Um, this is a photograph of uh, Eugene Boring, uh, one of the preeminent New Testament scholars <coughs> in, based in Texas. And this is a photograph I took of him. Um, in. He's, he's one of the specialists in the book of Revelation, and in fact, the whole New Testament as well. And he went to... Um, Turkey for the first time in 2009. I was there with him. And at that time, I've been there, I don't know, six or seven times. And I have dinner. And Eugene, if you're watching this, I know you don't mind. So I said, Eugene, you must have been here like a million times. My goodness, I've read your book and seminary. He said, no, no, first time for me. And I said, this is the first time that you have been to Turkey? He said, yeah. And of course he said, uh, young man, it's all relative, right? I know, <laughs> but he, he said to me, young man, how old are you? So at the time I said, um, I'm 49. Well, when I was your age, you could not even come here safely. We didn't know where to go. There were no hotels. We didn't know anything. We didn't have NASA technology telling us where to find. So he was reading for the first time some Assyrian script off the wall. That kind of, um, he's in his 80s now. Is that Ephesus? Um, no, this is in Sardis. Yeah, one of the seven seven cities. Assyrian. Sorry. Assyrian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, you have to uh, oh. you have to do a, a Assyriology and, oh. and a Babylonian and Elamite. In any case, so I uh, it, it shocked me a bit. I didn't think about this. I assumed that everybody who's ever written commentaries have been here back and forth, and I said no. And then he said, I wish I were 30, 40 years younger because oh my God, the number of things I could do, the things I would have to rewrite, and a lot of stuff. But there, there we go. Now, um, it reminded me, this was, this was 2009, not that many years ago, right? Just seven years ago. And now the way things are happening in Turkey, it may close for a long time to come. Things are very, very bad in Turkey now. Um, which means it's possible that if things go south, that will be the last time he'd seen in his lifetime, or my lifetime. Many things will be destroyed by the time you know, uh, we do a gift. So, um, for people who are asking, Ron, why are you always rushing to do these sort of excavation trips? Because time is really of the essence. I have no idea when it's going to shut down. And when it cuts down, it's normally for a generation. We have no idea what's going to happen in Syria, when it'll be safe to go back. And a place like, like Cambodia and other war-torn lands, when there's a major war, you kind of don't want to go back again because there, there are a lot of unexploded ordinances lying about. You could just get blown up walking the wrong place and down. So it's not a good idea. In any case, now, let's look at archaeological discoveries that confirm the historicity of the Bible. Let me give you the good news first. Remember I said 50-50? Well, this is the first good 50. I will read all of it because you've all got it, right? I sent to you guys. And you've got it. If you haven't found it, look at the Berean Facebook page. You'll find a long list from Genesis 47 to Genesis uh, to Chronicles. Uh, let me mention a few. Uh, Ramastus II, the fair Ramastus II. 
There's a lot of dispute, but very likely if there is an historical Moses and if there was a historical Pharaoh that he confronted, it's most likely this guy called Ramos II, otherwise called Ramos the Great. And today, if you want to see some of his buildings that he built and some of the stuff, you will fly to Cairo and you do your trip in Luxor and all the boat down the Nile River. And then there's always this option because not everyone wants to pay money to do that. Normally about $150, a very early aeroplane trip to just one place called Abu Simbel. And Abu Simbel is very close to where Egypt and um, Sudan becomes two different countries. And there you find Ramesses the Great. He built four monster statues of himself right at the mountain. And the one you see, by the way, in a sense, is a fake one. And the reason it's a fake one was because they built the Aswan Dam and the dam would have flooded it. So the Americans, and I think it was Rockefeller money, they really cut the whole thing up and brought the whole thing up a few hundred feet higher up to replace it. So the one you're going to see right now in the sense is in the wrong place, but that's not here or there. Well, I didn't understand the dates here. Yeah. These dates are 1279 to 1213, and you talk about Joseph here. Joseph. BC. Where, where is Joseph? Sorry. It's, it's just um, a slide of, yeah. Joseph. No, Joseph gave the family the best of the land in the land of Ramesses, right? This land of Ramesses is different from Ramesses the second as a person. The summer second person is 1279 to oh, 1239, right? So Joseph was a lot earlier, right. but I'm saying yeah. uh, we know the name Ramesses in the Bible because it's mentioned as the land of Ramesses. So it's called Pi Ramesses. Ramesses Pi. Uh, second Kings 199 is very close to my heart, the second one. Because it refers to Haka, king of Ethiopia, it's mentioned as um, mm. a king of what is called the land of Kush. And of course, last year, um, was it last year? I think it's last year, when I went to the Sudan, we actually saw um, the physical evidence of this king that's mentioned. And there are other kings as well, the Josiah, King Necho. You can find most of it in the British Museum. And in America, most of the major stuff that uh, we're talking about in terms of archaeological historicity of the Bible is not found here, it's found in Boston, in the Museum of Fine Arts. The Museum of Fine Arts is one of the largest Western depositories <coughs> of Nubian art. So you know, if you go to the museum, check it out. I think it's under renovation now for a two-year period, so I'm not sure whether it's uh, fully open yet. Let's move a few slides on to the biblical city of Ai, was discovered this is um let me quickly show you here i feel bad for the people watching the video but you will have it on your powerpoint slides so here we go this is the city of i from a aerial view i just want to show you what exists um, let's look at then how did archaeology influence biblical studies 1945 the discovery of what is called a nag hammadi library. Two years later, 1947, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in what is called the Qumran Library. How does this help biblical studies? It began to show us that a lot of stuff that we thought didn't exist actually did exist, but we just haven't discovered it yet. It helped to constrain scholars who over mythologize the New Testament. So the German scholars at one point began to get a bit carried away, began to say, you know, I bet some of this stuff like Noah, Abraham, uh, Adam and Eve, they're mythical figures. Um, they, they're probably not real figures because real figures don't act and talk like that and serpents don't speak and donkeys don't speak Hebrew and all that. We got that. And after a while, they kind of, they kind of go a bit further. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking the whole thing is mythical. It's kind of easy to say that after a while because that solved all the problems, right? When these two libraries were discovered and then they began to realize, <coughs> hang on a second, you can get carried away with this mythical idea where everything is mythical and then you got all kinds of problems. It returns biblical studies to the realm of history and geography. What happens with the discovery of these documents is that it locates where things were found and it tells us that there were historical basis for some of the things that we have inherited. Now here's the reason. If you um, grew up as a Christian, as I did, chances are when you're a child and you say, I go to church and I become a Christian, the last thing in your mind was asking for proof. You can assume that someone with a higher pay grade knows the stuff. Then you get older and you realize, oh my God, no one with a higher pay grade knows the stuff. And then begin to ask questions, right? You go to college, in the first class in religion, you get hit um, with the jaw and you go, oh my goodness. Archaeology actually came to, um, in defense of the church in so many ways because 
you begin to find the 50% of stuff like this, for example, this was a major one. So can you imagine before 1837, when this was not yet discovered, it was really hard for anyone to say that there was such a thing as Cyrus who let the Jews go back to rebuild because this wasn't found. After this, major difference. And all kinds of stuff over there you'll discover. Now, Nebo is the that. Persians didn't really have their own history too, right? Oh, the Persians, Persians don't have a lot of history. Almost everything we know of the Persian history written by the Greeks. So they probably didn't write about Cyrus. You Greeks. I mean, you, can, you go everywhere and you write and record things. And Okay. Um, I'm going to mention a few stuff. Recovers the evidence necessary for reconstructing the biblical text. Why are we reconstructing the biblical text? Well, because the text is kind of hard to make sense of. The texts were not written for you and me. They were written for people who are familiar with the vocabulary. So when they say things like um, in Chronicles and Kings, and the stuff I'm telling you, well, I guess you, we all know about it. It's in the book of Gad. And you go, the book of what? The book of Gad. Don't you know the book of Gad? And you said, never heard of it. Well, you haven't, but they have. So we want to find out where is Gad, who is Gad, and who wrote what book. Or the book of Enoch, and you go, what? Who is that? And that's what's happening with this discovery. I'm going to mention four things about archaeology supporting biblical accounts, 1876 and 1906. The discovery of the Hittite kingdom in Genesis, uh, Genesis 1520 and 1 Kings 10, 29. It mentioned the Hittites. The most famous Hittite is Uriah the Hittite, husband of Bathsheba. And who is Bathsheba? Bathsheba is the mother of Solomon, which means what? Very likely Solomon is half Hittite. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. If Solomon is half Hittite, can you imagine what Jesus is? Oh, did I say that? Oh, you know, you shouldn't listen to him this. But they discovered the Hittite kingdom. Today, it's right in central Turkey. If you go on a major tour, you go to the town of Hattusha, and you'll find them worshipping water. Why do you worship water for? There's the kingdoms. Water is really important. You want to worship water. 1907, the discovery of the walls of Jericho. Surprise, people said it exist. Now it does. 1924, discovery of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, now, when we say the study, the discovery of Sodom and Gomorrah, I'll show you photographs later on. Do we know for sure it is the city of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible? In most of these discoveries, you don't have a hundred percent clarity and affirmation, but you have better than nothing clarification. You have found something, and people say Jericho, and you can find some kind of evidence that relates to it. 1993, I'm not sure how, how recent all this stuff is. The discovery of the, stand, the Dan Stele in the city of Dan, and it has what is called the House of David inscription. Okay, so let me, so let me show you here. This is uh, my photograph uh, in Turkey, the Hittites. See, they worship water. Um, this is Jericho. This is Sodom and Gomorrah, um, question mark, very horrible question mark, okay, in archaeology. This is the stella of um, uh, Dan with the house of David, but David inside that, right? Well, there's actually more than just archaeological evidence of Sodom and Gomorrah, there's also geological evidence. Yeah, yeah, a lot of stuff. Uh, we just don't know whether it is that one or it's not, because there's an element of uncertainty. But the fact that we found something very close to it was quite staggering. 